All right, so we're recording. Hello, everybody, and welcome to TGI, which uh, stands for the greatest indoor reading series. Uh, Great Indoors, awesome name, taken by an interior design podcast. I think I've said that before, but it's just not, I don't want, I've actually, I have an email associated with this that we don't really use, uh, and I've actually gotten things uh, like, what colors uh, can you recommend for someone with seasonal affective disorder? And I'm, I want to write back and be like, I have no idea. I'm sorry, <laughs> but I haven't. Anyway, hello. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Rich Creswell. Uh, I am a um, audio slash uh, voiceover person here in Queens, New York. Um, and we have been going with this reading series now since the end of March. So we're coming up on, what is that? Nine months? No, that math's no good. Seven? I don't know. It's been a while. We've been doing it. We're here every week. We took one week off. Uh, anyone who wants to come by, um, I agree with Erica. What even is time anymore? I don't know. It could be, we could have been doing this show 70 years. We could have been doing it for two weeks. I'm not sure. It's kind of like that scene in the lighthouse where Willem Dafoe really goes crazy. Anyways, um, uh, we have a wonderful night tonight. We have, uh, two prose writers, two poets. I think it's going to be great. Um, we, a little bit of housekeeping just beforehand. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter if you've not done so at TGICast. We also have a website, which is TGICast.com, which now has event listings that are coming up and a video archive of events that have previously happened. Um, I have not figured out any sort of tagging that lets it search by author or anything, but that hopefully will be coming. But everything um, is there. That's the hub for information. Um, and with that, I don't really feel like there's much else to say. It's the middle of October. It rained horrendously today. I got soaked. I had to go to Costco, which during coronavirus times is immensely stressful, uh, but also much less stressful than many things people have to do. So what I'm essentially saying is I could complain, but I won't. All right. Our first writer, our reader this evening is Caroline Bach. Her debut short story collection, Carry Her Home, was the winner of the 2018 Fiction Award from the Washington Writers Publishing House. She is also the author of the critically claimed young adult novels, Lie and Before My Eyes from St. Martin's Press. She's the fiction editor of This Is What America Looks Like, Poetry and Fiction from D.C., Maryland, and Virginia from the Washington Writers Publishing House, scheduled for publication in February 2021. A graduate of Syracuse University, she had the great luck and honor to study creative writing with Raymond Carver, Carver and Tobias Wolf. In 2011, she earned her MFA in fiction from the City College in New York. Currently, she lectures in English and creative writing at Marymount University in Arlington, and she lives in Maryland. Caroline, I can ask you to unmute and you can take it away. Great. Thank you, Ridge. Thank you, Noli. Everybody can hear me. Um, I'm going to read a, uh, actually the last story from my collection. And it's because I've been thinking during the pandemic that this time cannot last forever. It cannot last forever. And there was another time in my life when I also wanted to realize that the past cannot be with us forever. Uh, so this is a short, short story. And I so appreciate being here with everybody. Um, and here we go. Here's the title. Are you still there? I'm calling her. Both of us hating the phone. She uses the phone with the cord that winds around the kitchen into the hall and the pink and green bathroom. She hides there, the house's only bathroom. She could be interrupted at any moment by a younger sibling or by her pop, even though, she, even though everyone else in the house is in bed. Still, she doesn't want to talk. She hasn't figured things out yet. No, everything is fine, but it isn't. And she doesn't know how to say this yet. It's just easier to say that everything is okay with the bath towels bunched on the floor and the blue toothpaste dotting the porcelain sink and the window open and the autumn leaves slick on the rotting sill and the air crisp 
with ivory soap and the first cold rain of winter. Are you still there? You ask your younger self. Where else would I be? She exhales, the phone roughing against her mouth, a refusal to continue this conversation, which later your younger self will deem dumb, a dumb dream. Her hair is a tangle on her substantial shoulders. She wears tattered t-shirts to bed. She will for years. She doesn't know that soon she will be gone from this house. She believes it will never end. Being 12, being 13, before she is 18, she will go. You want to tell the younger version of you on the edge of the lid of the toilet seat, elbows on bare knees, arms blotched with purpled welts, that you will go far, that you will never have to return, that your memory will have blank spaces long pauses to heal. When you are old, like you are now, some memories will arise when least expected. Like a call in the night, this knowledge of your younger self will awaken you and you will know it is not a dream. You will be able to talk then, even if you don't want to talk. Wow, Caroline, thank you so much. Uh, I, I usually, I forgot to say this up at the top, but generally by way of segue, I tend to just sort of give my thoughts or, or tell, tell writers what I got out of it. Uh, that was actually, um, first of all, you're, you're an incredible reader. I can hear like the conviction and the, and the, just the, the delivery is fantastic, but also we were talking about something kind of similar to this, uh, just like before anybody else got here. And I think um, for people with uh, really truly negative experiences early in life, um, that developing a relationship with the version of yourself that got stuck there is very important. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I can hear the, the understanding and the wisdom and the work that has gone into thinking about it, um, you know, and and that, I guess the best way I can say it, like, I don't know, maybe the guy who wrote it had a really great life, but that song, I wish I knew then what I knew now when I was younger, you know that one? Mm -hmm. Why does that song sound happy? Because that's not a happy thought to me. <laughs> it's, it's a difficult thought. And I, I can hear that in there and, and you know, just wishing that you could go back and say, you know, one day this will be okay, but it, it remains difficult. And it, it, um, definitely, um, requires frequent checking in with that younger version of yourself to find out how much of you is still stuck there. And I think that's the thing that I got the most out of. So that's, that's really beautiful. So your book, um, carry her home available now. Uh, and it looks like, um, we have a link for that. Uh, let me see if, I guess, Noli, do you want to paste the, we can get the link in there for, for it from uh, Politics and Prose is the preferred bookstore? It's my local independent. Yeah. Yeah. That's, honestly, we've had a few DC people and that's like the one I keep seeing <laughs> is <laughs> Politics and Prose. So that makes sense. But, but anyway, thank you so much for, for coming and sharing that with us. And, and definitely, um, you know, I, I'm curious to read more and, and find out a little bit more. No, oh, thank you. Well, I'm I'm uh, so thrilled to be here, and I can't wait to hear everyone else read. So, thank you, Ridge. Thank you, Noli. All right, thanks. All right, that was a wonderful start. All right, there's there's now a link in the chat. Thanks, Noli. Um, we're we're working on our system. We're getting it down. It's just I I can't figure out copy paste, so I'm not going to try to do it while I'm trying to talk to. I'm uh, I real, realizing my technical illiteracy. Uh, I feel like I'm finally entering adulthood uh, now. 
which is long overdue. So it's fine. Uh, anyways, our next uh, reader is Charlotte Seeley. She's a poet, writer, and editor from the Hudson Valley region of New York, currently residing in Kansas City, Missouri, with her cat, Lord Byron. She is the author of The World is My Rival, 2018. Ooh, that is a tough press to pronounce. Spite, spite and doivel? Sp spite and devil? Eh. And, her, and the chapbook, Die Young, Letters to Kesha, 2019, Dancing Girl Press. A graduate of the Emerson College MFA program, she previously served as editor-in-chief and poetry editor of Redivider and a poetry screener for Plowshares. Her work can be found in Wax9, Leveler, Luna Luna Magazine, Rattle, Passages North, Glass, A Journal of Poetry, Barrel House, and others. Without further, those of you who are new will know, will not know that I try not to say adieu. So without further uh, higgledy-piggledy, Charlotte, you can take it away. Hello. It, it's Spite and Dival. I, it, I don't know. I had to like practice it before I, you know. Um, anyway, thank you for having me, uh, Trina and Ridge. I really appreciate it. And I wanna give a quick shout out to Donald Vincent who um, recommended me. He read a few weeks ago and he's phenomenal. If you're looking for a book to read, his book came out in July, uh, Convenient Amnesia, and it's fantastic. Um, I'm gonna set a timer so I don't go over. So I'm going to do that right now and hope my cat doesn't wake up. Okay. <laughs> so I wasn't going to read this poem, but we have such New York energy going on that I'm going to, I'm going to read this poem from my book, The World is My Rival. Um, it's called The City Never Sleeps. Despite the city's impeccably walkable geography, I wish for a chariot, but walk alone. People say the city never sleeps. They're mostly tourists. The city is in a coma. I slept on a park bench, terribly afraid of rats. Living above Union Square, I had a dream. Someone mailed me a dead mouse, or maybe just the head. Mice used to jump from the oven, roaches in the shower. My life was filthy at best. I walked a lot to avoid the subway. I loved the thought of having a boyfriend, especially with a car. Maintenance of both is incredibly expensive. I dreamt I ran into you, and when I awake, I ran into you in daydreams. All our haunts are gone. I would trace blocked lettered handwriting on posters, follow them like a scavenger map. When I wanted to be anonymous, I'd go to the Olive Garden, a place you'd never be. I traversed the Williamsburg Bridge from the Lower East Side and felt lucky despite squandering my time. What if you had said, let go? What if the walk-ups in Chinatown were still cheap? Would you live there with me? Fill it with art in small frames? potted plants, say forever to a finite skyline. Can you carry this weight now that we're old? Remember when you shouldered an easel over the Brooklyn Bridge? You're built strong, I wanted to jump. A body weighs more or less than an easel. It's no use. Eating Popeyes by the river, wondering why you carried some things and not others. This part's gross, I'm sorry. Uh, once I watched a girl stick her whole hand and fingers down a man's throat in Mars bar. He was puking on himself and the floor, it was chunky. I spent so much time on the Lower East Side looking for you, not a tourist, but this isn't home either. So let's build or let go. I don't drive anything except anyone crazy, but we were connected way before we knew it. Like how tourists look for the dirty tile, which I do every time I'm in Grand Central because it reminds me of honesty and simpler times, the city between moments, catching a nap. Um. <laughs> I'm, I might return to, I don't know, I'm kind of sick of these poems, to be honest. So I'm going to read from my chat book a little bit, and then I thought I would read some new shit. So, um, all right. So this is from Die Young, Letters to Kesha. Um, if, if you do not know, Kesha is a pop, pop star. She was in the press a lot for um, a lot of, she wanted to get away from her, uh, 
manager, producer, producer, who was, um, she accused him of sexually assaulting her among, among other things and he wouldn't let her out of the contract. So it's just this whole mess. Um, so I am going to read for you, um, where is it? Kesha, I wish you were my best friend instead. Here's the part where you turn part convention. It's where someone always tries to define the terms of your legacy. Even when I confide in a friend, I become the woman who should have kept quiet, the woman she keeps around to pedestal her static existence. I have such unnecessary thoughts, like if I'm so lowbrow, why do you shade yourself in my skyscraper shadow? But it's not useful to ask or compare our energies. I'm a metallic cosmic rain and she's the star studded night. I'm the one stirring up the storm and she's the one asking me to stop. She was so regarded as beautiful, but a snob. If I may be so bold, maybe she's the storm and I'm the psychedelic shower. Maybe I'm the brilliance and she's the broken because you must be broken to try to break someone into such diminutive parts. She's the hipster mannequin in designer jeans who says the vintage sequin sweater you love is stupid. Caring is uncool. You're too fat to borrow her clothes and vehemently believes without saying that fun is the edge of whatever makes you mildly uncomfortable. Kesha, I wish you were my best friend instead. I am too fat to wear your clothes, but I don't think you would ever say that. I fantasize that you and I baptize each other in craft store glitter and weave skeins worth of friendship bracelets. It never occurred to her that kindness is what makes a good friend, and it occurred to me too late. The storm already broke, and the lightning shattered the night into sides. I only want to live to love, and if I can't live in love, then let me die. Um, this one's called, If You Were, how am I doing? If You're a Saber-Toothed Tiger. If you feel like a saber-toothed tiger sipping on a warm Budweiser, I feel like a city pigeon picking out a five-day-old Obon Pan croissant. If you feel like riding an elephant through the jungle, I feel like an hour long board meeting that should have been an email. If you're a unicorn, I'm a narwhal. If you're the glitter, I'm the dust. What is the opposite of love? Not hate, but an absence of love, a huge zero in a scoreboard. Isn't it weird how love is zero in tennis? I am so not athletic unless you consider kindness as a muscle. I try to exercise it, but I languish. I overextend. The wild electric comes so natural to you. Show me how to embrace those hot wired parts of myself. Bring a zebra print magnifying glass and the hot pink fuzzy handcuffs. Swallow the trauma when you kick back the key. If you're sipping on a warm Budweiser, I'm chugging the Arbor Mist. I'm passenger side in a busted caddy with you. We'll paint it gold and turn this town winning. If we all die before our time, we all come back alive when we realize the invalidity in that statement. It didn't even come from my mouth. I have a voice though. I'm yelling louder than theirs now. All right. Um, 10 minutes goes really fast. Um, okay, I'm gonna do, I'm, okay, so have, have you heard of a journal called Taco Bell Quarterly? I wrote a poem exclusively for this journal and I have not heard back from them. And I'm kind of annoyed. If you know anybody. Anyway, I mean, I don't think this is like literary gold, but like, I was like really excited. I, I love Taco Bell. Anyway, um, this is called Fire Hot Mild and it's after a poem by Dorothy Alasky um, called Mary Kill Fuck. Fire Hot Mild. Let's play kill, Mary fuck with the Taco Bell sauces. Fought, fought, <laughs> let me start again. <laughs> Let's play kill, Mary fuck with the Taco Bell sauces. Fire, hot, mild. I'll go ahead and say it. No one admits to liking mild. And if they do, they're probably mild. Lamo supreme. Like those memes that make fun of people who detect salt and pepper as spicy. Mild mixes genres, marinara adjacent. The mayo of sauce packets. Mayor of humdrum in a red MAGA hat screaming about his right to bear arms then points at his puny biceps. If, if looked past Oh, sorry. If I looked past that claw mouth drive through window and never saw his bleary pale orange face again, I'd be fine. Let's kill it. 
hide shreds of evidence in various rival fast food trash receptacles, smear it on hot dogs from Nathan's and seasoned curly fries from Arby's as a joke. Some might say they'd fuck fire because who wouldn't? Heat and flavor slinks out in a sultry red getup and who am I to hold them down? But I would wife her up, slide a ring down the perforated ruffle of her packaging, take the I do printed in a purposely sketchy font on her white bodice in earnest. Hello, my name is Mary to the game, salt in her blood, kicked in my teeth, forever emblazoned with our initials over the rogue stall in the family restroom. I do dine in forever with you, and the purple pink cushions barricading my shoulder blades from the crappy wood these stools and tables are made of. I guess that leaves you hot and bother, dripping in sweat. Sometimes I use you both and braid the flavors like a double helix over the innards of a cheesy gordita crunch. Maybe in this way you fuck each other, marry the detrius. Do you hate me because you cannot eat me, or know the type of cravings that eat me alive? Alive. The judgment buries me seven layers deep. Like, why can't I indulge in Foucault and fourth meal? Keep up with Kundera and the Kardashians. Graze on crudite and a Crunchwrap Supreme. The stigma stilts all joy. People fancy themselves clairvoyant. Predict explosive diarrhea in your future. I've never experienced a gastrointestinal mishap from Taco Bell, but I do remember the AOL email chain letter about the woman who ate the meat and soon little larva swap, little larvae swelled inside her gums, birthing horror in hungry pus filled smile. Was that even real? What about the finger found in a Wendy's to go chili bowl? I don't eat Wendy's. I wouldn't fuck Wendy's if it was the last fire sauce slathered morsel of sustenance on this earth. We we eat and fuck for sustenance, marry because we're told to, because how else do you communicate a love blazing forever? And we kill because we just can't help ourselves. We treat these all as they, I'm sorry, we treat these all as if they are not all consumption with different names. What else do you do with all this built up tension, all this power that love and food and fucking revs up in the paper wrapper of your crushed dreams and desires? How else do you enjoy this game? If you don't choose these fates from your own sick wiles, bite into it with sharpened fangs. Thank you. Wow, Cheryl, thank you so much. Um, I was not expecting uh, to close with a Taco Bell, but I really love. I, you know what? It, the the interesting thing about that and the and the, the letter to Kesha as well, your use of popular culture to get at these really deep actual feelings is really interesting because. Um, <laughs> I frequently refer to poetry in particular as um, like creeping in the back of me to make me feel a feeling like it's not up front, right? It's, it's, it's somehow yeah. induced. And, and what I was getting out of that was laughter, but also this, there were so many truths about what people want out of relationships, what people want out of, you know, experiences, uh, what people don't want, all these things. And it, uh, I, I would be dumbfounded permanently, I will be permanently muted if Taco Bell Quarterly does not respond. Um, I also just wanted to bring up, uh, and this is a bit of sort of self-promotion briefly, if you go on our website and go to the video archive and you look up um, uh, July 17th, I believe it is, we had a poet named Matthew Yeager on who read an ode to the McRib. It is outstanding. So it's similar, similar vibe of just like, at first I'm like, what, why did you take your time to do? Oh my gosh. And then there's just all this thought coming out of it. Um, so I, I really thought that was wonderful. And then, you know, um, so many just, uh, the, you know, the, 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 the best friend poem, you know, to, to Kesha, so many uh, references to like just the things that we end up with unhealthy in our relationships, you know, and, and just, the, the little ways we allow people to erode us without us really noticing because it's just maybe it's how we've always been treated. Maybe it's how we feel we deserve to be treated or maybe it's just we've known this person since we were 12 or whatever. Um, so I think taking the time to think about that is also wonderful. This is, this is fantastic. So you have some, we have two books available and uh, I posted it in the chat um, that uh, people can Venmo you directly as well. And then you'll, you'll sign them and, and hopefully write or draw taco or something. 
I don't know that you want me to draw a taco. I have no artistic skills whatsoever, but I'll do some. I'll draw. I'll draw a little heart or something. Draw a little kitty face. You know? Okay, that's like, fair like, enough. That's my. That's where it ends. <laughs> that's totally <laughs> fine. Uh, and people can find out more about you at uh, charlottesealy.com as well. So, awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, and um, yeah, I am. I know all. I will put it this way. I know several people who I think may just need to get a copy of um, of Letters to Kesha. Just have it show up. I, I think it's the, I know the target audience here. So anyway, thank you very much. All right, moving forward. Our next reader is Sokoya Nagamatsu. He's the author of the forthcoming novels, How High We Go in the Dark and Girl Zero, William Morrow, Harper Collins, excuse me, Wow, that garbled. William Morrow, HarperCollins, and Bloomsbury UK, respectively. And the story collection, Where We Go When All We Were Is Gone, from Black Lawrence Press. So, I apologize, Sequoia. My tongue is betraying me on your intro. Uh, it's the silver medal winner of the 2016 Forward Reviews Indies Book of the Year Award, an Entropy Magazine Best Book of 2016, and a notable book at BuzzFeed. His work has appeared or is forthcoming in publications such as Conjunctions, the Southern Review, Ziziva, Tin House, Iowa Review, Lightspeed Magazine, and One World, a global anthology of short stories, and has been listed as notable in Best American Non-Required Reading and the Best Horror of the Year. Originally from Hawaii and the San Francisco Bay Area, he was educated at Grinnell College, BA in Anthropology, and Southern Illinois University, MFA in Creative Writing. He co-edits Psychopomp Magazine, an online quarterly dedicated to innovative prose, and teaches at St. Olaf College. He previously taught at the College of Idaho and the Martha's Vineyard Institute of Creative Writing. He lives in the Twin Cities region of Minnesota with his wife, the writer Cole Nagamatsu, and their cat, Kalahira. Without further pother, Sakoi, you can take it away. Great. Um, so I'm going to read... Um a little bit of um, the novel, How, How, we, How High We Go in the Dark, um, that's coming out in 2022. Um, so a bit far away from now, but the Goodreads page is already there, should you wanna um, remind yourself. Um, so a little bit about this novel is, um, uh, it took about 10 years to write. Uh, I was one of those, those ideas that I kind of came in uh, during grad school um, kind of telling my classmates that oh, I'm going to write a novel and you know be my thesis and then I'll sell it immediately, but that didn't really end up happening. It took <laughs> several more years to kind of figure out you know how to write a novel, um, and you know doing a lot of traveling and reading along the way to kind of sort of figure out you know what this thing's supposed to be. Um, so it's it does deal with a pandemic, and um, so obviously it, it was written before kind of this current age. Um, but I think it's still very prescient in a lot of ways since um, it sort of like is dealing more with the uh, um, both the origin and also aftermath um, of, of, of a virus, uh, even decades and, and generations after the fact. Um, so as far as the time scale of the novel, um, it starts about 30,000 years ago and ends about 6,000 years from now. Um, so <laughs> a pretty big time scale. The core of the novel is about 30 years, um, but um, there are pretty big time jumps. Um, so I'll, I'll read a little bit of this, and this is one of the last chapters. Um, it's probably one of the more experimental um, sections. Um, it was published um, as a story years ago uh, in a much earlier form uh, by Black Warrior Review. All right, the scope of possibility. Let me actually put my timer on as well, so I'm staying on track. All right, the scope of possibility. When she was 700 years old, still a baby by world builder standards, I walked my daughter to the seed field where I had been designing earth. Kids usually weren't allowed in the seed fields until they completed their apprenticeship in their second millennia, but I needed to show her. She needed to understand. We walked between the rows of giant spheres, some as big as moons, glowing with ribbons of light as I told stories about each one. The fields are where most of the advanced civilizations in the galaxy come from. And for all we know, every galaxy has a world builder planet orbiting just outside in the dark, utterly alone. But at the time, our world was just a giant playground to her. I stood in front of a tiny blue seed and handed her a probability scope. This is what I've been doing for most of your life, I said. 
and one day, not long from now, this is where I'll go, to observe, guide if needed. I'll be one of them, little one. I'll be among their first and their last, but I'll always be your mother. Nyori, my poor girl, looked betrayed when I left, like the light within her flicked off for a moment when, I, when she realized I wasn't coming back. No more walks, no more telling bad jokes to the laughing tree, no more looking at funny animals together through the probability scope that may or may not exist in the future. And that's all I could think about, traps in my cradle, my space pod, whatever you want to call it, for centuries. I was so much older when my mother left me, had already completed my training. She was just too young to realize, you see. Sure, we could get from point A to point B much faster, sure. A day, a week, a month for the farthest corners. But maybe the elders wanted it this way, for the world builders to have time to dwell on what was being left behind and become comfortable with forgetting. But how could I ever forget? I landed beneath the water and washed ashore as a small sea creature, an ancestor of the starfish. My cradle, as far as I know, has been long trapped in hundreds of feet of ice. When I first came here, I could not walk, obviously did not have the biological means to do so, could not write in journals or relay those words like I am now. I've confided in others every now and then, but I had to be careful. I can't come back from some things, the sorts of deaths that seem to be popular for so long, like burning and decapitation. For those first few eons, there was nothing but water, ash, the simplest of organisms, and the seed I had launched into the heart of the planet. I fell in love with a box jelly and then a trilobite, but they were single-sided love affairs. She didn't understand. She asked if she could go. Mommy, please, she said, I'll be good. The elders who determined seed launch order long before any of us were born assigned my husband and his first child to be among the last world builders to remain. And so we got used to saying goodbye to everyone we cared about, our neighbors, my best friend, the boy who once told me he would love me forever, even if the planet he engineered and would care for had a 78% chance of being populated by sexy bipedal crustaceans with extreme sex drives. I remember putting the scope to the seed, helping Yuri carry its weight, adjusting the dial so she could see what might happen to Earth. Probability scopes are an important part of our technology, like telescopes, but fitted with the lenses made from the jelly-like remains of our ancestors. They allow us to see through rea reality based on the contents of each seed. My father used to say our planet and everyone on it was made of pure possibility. And I think he wasn't simply talking about the radiant light flowing in our rivers that lit the crevices of our deepest caves like neurons firing in our brains. And that's what made us special, made us able to create and become anything we wanted. And what happens to us when we leave our world? What happens to us when we travel the stars? Children were trained to answer, we become everything we pass until we become, be until we become the thing we created. Our bodies would transform as we passed star system after star system, our bodies becoming a catalog of everything our race had given birth to, becoming a Xylian, a Parsu, a Charlian Mork, a Quiali, a Dimetrodon, a Pangaea. After millions of years, I decided to start my first Earth family to help me feel whole again. As a Neanderthal, I helped my tribe survive migration and winters and wars with early humans. I fell in love with a man who killed a saber-toothed cat with nothing but his muscular hands and a small stone blade. We made love in caves and besides the carcasses of woolly mammoths. And when my womb filled with life, I thought I could finally just be happy with the illusion of a mortal life. But when my daughter was born, I saw a possibility growing under, her, her, under my skin like a nebula. She had her father's brow ridges and eyes and stubborn demeanor. She had my nose and shards of my true self flowing through her veins like stars because I had imperfectly shapeshifted into my Neanderthal body. And because some small part of my original, my original self had remained when I shifted into my new body, possibility became a disease, a virus blooming throughout the fragile bodies of my cave mates. At first, we believed it was just a normal sickness from the cold of the tundra, from those nights when our fires went cold. But then, one by one, hunters came back with fevers, mothers caring for their children's struggle to breathe. And soon, I was the only one remaining who could stand, tending the fires, roaming the plains for game, cradling the lifeless bodies of those who did not wake up. 
my daughter would not hold on to whatever I put into her mouth. I had prayed that because she was mine, whatever plague I had inadvertently passed on would somehow spare her. But I watched her stomach sink into itself, the blood bubbling from her mouth. I held her close to my chest, feeling her last heartbeats, her last breath, the last sound she uttered, a strained and mournful terror. I left my daughter on a bed of leaves and grass beside a carving of my star system, a place I wanted her to dream about as she left the world, and covered her in a hide sewed with seashells I had collected during my early travels as a hominid. I told her she had a sister somewhere out there. I told her that she would always be a part of me. I etched memories and song and the science of my world into the floors of the cave. I did not want that I did not want lost time. I built a fire, sang one last, uh, sang one final lullaby to my daughter and left them as the sun rose. I crossed sheets of ice and transformed into a human and lived alone for centuries, trying to forgive myself for being so careless with my shape-shifting, making sure my mistake would never happen again. <clears throat> they called me Tiamat, the Sumerians. And while I had another face back then, I can assure you I was no multi-headed dragon goddess as the myths record. I taught them to fish, to make nets and small vessels. I taught them irrigation and how to wield the top power of the Tigris and Euphrates. It was a busy time, as you might guess. Before I came, people there mucked around in the dirt and sand, barely clinging to life. And I think I busied myself with teaching, with side projects like building cigarettes, because if I stopped, if I just watched, I would miss Nuri and the cave daughter I barely got to know too much whenever I saw a couple embrace or heard a child crying. I had a cat named Nuri during the kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar. Saying her name out loud brought me comfort. I could pretend like my daughter was with me. Nuri, dinner is ready. Nuri, time for bed. Nuri, I love you. Nuri, have you met your sister among the stars? Where are you, Nuri? Where are you? Do you see them? I asked her. Through the scope, we saw people hunting strange beasts with long sticks, people much smaller than us with skin you couldn't see through, without light dancing within like nebulae. They had hair like so many species, and they traveled great distances in groups carrying fire. The grass was green and not purple like our rolling hills. Some families had four-legged pets like her Zebra and Jabi, except without horns and scales. I saw wars among larger tribes, Wars of people clad in metal. I saw tiny vessels breaking free of the planet and great cities floating above it in rings of glass. I saw a civilization that could destroy itself before it reached the nearest star. But I also saw a world that would be the first to reach the quiet of intergalactic space, walk the ruins of whatever remains of us. And I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Wow, Sequoia, thank you. Um, that was, when you first mentioned that the sort of time scale, I was not expecting to get that much of it in one, one piece, which is I think wonderful though, because you, I guess the, the main thought I had while listening was, um, you know, uh, speculative or science fiction is, you know, generally used to say something about people. That's what it's for, it's, you know, it's rarely literal. Unfortunately, um, there's been a, a preoccupation with it, um, within it. Uh, I don't know how long it goes back, but quite some ways where the only parts that you tend, the only science fiction you tend to see has to do with uh, allegories about war. So there's always people fighting in space or people, aliens fighting each other. Or people are angry or hateful or whatever. And this idea of, um, of using it as a way to look at uh, things like grief and guilt and love and uh you know the idea of, of of a being who's capable of experiencing all these different relationships across you know eons is such a wonderful way to just uh get at very basic true emotions for for people and as also the idea of of a alien race that actually rather than conquering, destroying, et cetera, develops things, <laughs> you know, actually tries to make something, you know, is such a, um, 
it's sort of such an optimistic viewpoint to take. And I, I really like that. Uh, so I'm, I'm now, um, the only, the only drawback I will say is I'm now slightly irritated that I don't get to read the rest of this for two years, but that's okay. <laughs> I know how things work. Um, but that's, that's, uh, wonderful. So the other, you, you mentioned, um, before we got started that you had, uh, you have two books coming out uh, in the next couple of years. Is the other book this type of, is it science fiction-ish as well? Or is it yeah, different? yeah. Like I would say like my sort of like general mode is sort of like literary fiction that mm -hmm. is science fictional in some way or, or, or fabulous in some way. Sure. Uh, you know, like I, I, I very rarely write sort of like straight realist fiction. And if, and if I do, it's something, you know, there's probably something extreme happening in there, whether whether it's horrific or or, or whatever it be, or whatever it happens to be, um, mm -hmm. I just I just can't do sort of like domestic realism. Oh, that's that's fine. I think using um, you know, using more imaginative uh, premises, circumstances, whatever it might be, is a way for for some people to get at, you know, the, again the the experiences and emotions that might be more domestic. Um, but that's wonderful. So okay, so we will keep an eye out. Uh, and please let us know if, uh, if you have anything else coming out, because I would love to, to read more. So, all right. Thank you very much. Um, all right. Our final reader this evening is Erica Meitner. I'm assume I'm pronouncing that correctly. Who knows? She's nodding. Excellent. <laughs> I was cocky on that one. I was like, I bet that's it. So, gotta ask sometimes. Uh, anyway, she is the author of five books of poems, including Ideal Cities, HarperCollins 2010, which was a 2009 National Poetry Series winner, Copia, BOA Editions 2014, and Holy Moly Carry Me, BOE Editions 2018, which won the 2018 National Jewish Book Award in Poetry and was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award. Her sixth book of poems, Useful Junk, is forthcoming from BOA Editions in 2022. Meitner's poems have been anthologized widely and have appeared in publications including Best American Poetry, Plowshares, Virginia Quarterly Review, The New York Times Magazine, The New Republic, Poetry, and The Believer. Other honors include fellowships from McDowell, the Wisconsin Institute for Creative Writing, the Virginia Center for Creative Arts, the Hermitage Artist Retreat, and Blue Mountain Center. She was also the 2015 U.S.-U.K. Fulbright Distinguished Scholar in Creative Writing at the Seamus Haney Center for Poetry at Queen's University Belfast. Meitner is currently a professor of English at Virginia Tech. All right, Erica, you can unmute and take it away. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Um, is my sound okay? Can everyone hear me? Okay, great. Um, I thought I'd try out some new stuff that I've never read before. I don't never know if that'll be a disaster or okay. Um, so this is one, I, I've been working on this project for three years in Florida. So I have a lot of poems set in Florida and this is one of them. Um, and this is one of the few poems I've written actually like during the pandemic um, because I have children who you may hear screaming in the background. Um, so I haven't had much time to write. Assembled audience. This morning on the beach, there's a small nurse shark whiskered and flipped on the sand and right past its shined white underbelly, a man dissipated, ponytailed, leathery, filming his younger blonde girlfriend with his phone. She's wearing a tiny print bikini, the kind that's nearly a thong, cheeky, and is literally shaking her ass. When she stops, he says, did we get it? And she must have nodded no, because he says, ah, oh, fuck, let's do it again. I know what I gotta do. Helene Sisu said to be human, we need to experience the end of the world. And do you agree with her right now in this particular moment? There's a tropical storm throttling towards us and everyone is out on the sand before the cone of uncertainty sidles its way up the eastern seaboard. Even a bridal party in blush-colored gowns, even a family reunion in matched t-shirts. So many things remain uncertain. I keep thinking of what my friend Emily, who chained herself to a bulldozer to protest the Mountain Valley pipeline, told me. Pipeline fighters never ask, how are you? They simply say, it's good to see you. 
It's good to see you random strangers on the beach. I've been in my house for months. You under your striped umbrellas. You smoking weed in the surf. You fishing from the shore. You head down searching for washed up shark teeth in the shell hash. Your radios and coolers and sun hats. I know what I gotta do. Buy bottled water, safeguard the soul's passage, check the flashlight batteries, map a topography of displacement and exile, remain untouched, the hollow space of the body, the nothing of my mouth covered by a mask. Sisu also said my body knows unheard of songs, laments, to use a gesture to communicate something. The same crowd never gathers twice. A dead fish can symbolize an uneasiness in your body. Someone who is unresponsive, a portent of bad things to come. It can mean you're next on the hit list, an occupation of loss. My poems tend to be long, so I'll probably only read like three, maybe four. Um, I was gonna read this one because it's like a Bill Nye, The Planet is on Fire poem and also has actual handmaids in it. So I feel like that's like appropriate for this week with the Amy coming off the Amy Coney Barrett hearings. Um, and it talks about, uh, what is it? Ta it talks about infertility. It talks about um, abortion. It talks about all kinds of things um, and, and Appalachia. So I just jammed it all in, it's fine. I've never read this one either. So y'all are like my test audience here. What I'm saying is the planet is on fucking fire, says Bill Nye, the science guy. And I wanna say, amen, Bill, I am half witness to this. Our superlative rainstorms, the river always swollen past its banks. The wide stretches of sand from my childhood just gone at the beach. Lifeguard shack meets ocean meets parking lot, all within a few feet of each other. I walk my mountain neighborhood in spring dusk and notice the gaps where cemetery oaks stood before the Duracho, straight line wind event that took them out along with power for a week. That year I had thousands of dollars of out-of-pocket fertility drugs in our fridge and had to move all the vials to campus, powered by the university's coal plant, which endured the storm and kept running. My office is downwind, so books get coated in a fine sheen of black dust in minutes when I open my window, and this week my cough won't quit. This week, Bill, I watched you take a blowtorch to a globe on television to illustrate global warming to the viewing audience while the radio news was all fetal heartbeat bills, near total bans on abortions in Kentucky, Louisiana, Georgia. And I thought of the time I waited for a friend under the gold clock in Grand Central Terminal while a bevy of women wearing red hooded cloaks and severe white bonnets walked past in pairs. I gawked with tourists as the women slowly circled the station before I realized they weren't actual nuns or a cult, but a promo stunt for the Hulu version of Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale. This week in Harlan County, a group of miners are blocking a coal train to protest unpaid wages owed to them. My friend Christine was a women's clinic nurse before she became an anthropologist and offered to teach a group of us academics how to perform abortions. It's just suction, she says. Bill, we all know what will happen to us when the temperature rises, floods, fires, crop failures, extinction. In Alabama, girls will be forced to carry their rapist babies. And Bill, do you even know how to date a pregnancy correctly? One-fifth of coal miners in this region, a place that's been stripped and fucked over limitless times by corporations, have black lung disease. You add 280 days to the first day of your last period. In Ohio, the state legislature introduced a bill that requires doctors to reimplant an ectopic pregnancy into a woman's uterus, which is physically impossible. 
There is every reason I should be anti-abortion, Bill. The years of peeing on sticks and injections, the IUI and IVF, the adoption. But I believe in bodily autonomy. My colleague who locked herself to an excavator to stop the Mountain Valley pipeline from tearing through our streams and forests to bring fracked gas right past us from West Virginia to sell abroad. On TV, you say, you're adults now, and this is an actual crisis. And Bill, I want to burn this whole motherfucker to the ground, but I don't have to. We are in cataclysmic decline, and you're here with me, your blanket, fire extinguisher, bucket of sand lined up next to you. I am failing to find productive uses for my rage, for the hard and dangerous work of having a body in the Anthropocene. So I shear butterfly bushes and barberry back from my vinyl siding and hose spigot, tend to my fig tree whose branches are dead, whose leaves new and green cluster around the roots. Bill Nye. I'm going to do some Walmart. I feel like I have to read this now. The Walmart poem is actually from a couple books ago. Um, so I, have to, I feel like I have to put my hair up for the Walmart poem. It's like one of those. Um, so that's from my, Walmart is from my book Copia. So I'm going to read Walmart. Um, I have no idea how long I've been reading. Hopefully not too long. Okay. Everything in this poem took place in a week-long period in parking Walmart parking lots all over America. Um, I wrote it using a Google News search. Walmart Supercenter. God bless America, says the bumper sticker on the racer red rascal scooter that accidentally cuts me off in the Walmart parking lot. After a guy in a tricked out Jeep with rims like chrome pinwheels tries to pick me up by honking, all before I make it past the automatic doors, waiting to accept my unwashed hair, my flip flops, my lounge pants. The old man on the scooter waves, sports a straw boater banded in blue and white, and may or may not be the official greeter, but everyone here sure is friendly. Even the faces of plastic bags, which wink yellow and crinkle with kindness, sound like applause when they brush the legs of shoppers carrying them to their cars. In Port Charlotte, a woman's body was found in a Jetta in a Walmart parking lot. In a Walmart parking lot in Springfield, a macaque monkey named Charlie attacked an eight-year-old girl. I am a Walmart shopper, a tract house dweller, the developments you can see clearly from every highway in America that's not jammed up on farmland or pinned in by mountains. I park my car at a slant in the lot, hugged tight by my neighbor's pickups. I drive my enormous cart through the aisles and fill it with pampers, tube socks, juice boxes, fruit. In the parking lot of the McAllen Walmart, a woman tried to sell six Bengal tiger cubs to a group of Mexican day laborers. A man carjacked a woman in the parking lot of the West Mifflin Walmart, then ran under a bridge and disappeared, which is to say that the world we expect to see looks hewn from wood, is maybe two lanes wide, has readily identifiable produce, and the one we've got instead has jackknifed itself on the side of the interstate and keeps skidding. The one we've got has clouds traveling so fast across the sky. It's like they're tied to an electric current. But electricity is the same for everybody. It comes in the top of your head and goes out your shoes, which will walk through these automatic doors. In the Corbin Walmart parking lot, a woman with a small amount of cash was arrested for getting in and out of trucks a man stepped out of his car in the Columbus Walmart parking lot and shot himself. I get in the checkout line behind a lighted number on a pole. The man in front of me jangles coins in his pocket, rocks back and forth on his heels. The girl in front of him carefully peels four moist dimes from her palm to pay for a small container of honey mustard dipping sauce. In the parking lot of the Lafayette Walmart, 
grandparents left their disabled two-year-old grandson sitting in a shopping cart and drove away. Employees in the parking lot at the LaGrange Walmart found a box containing seven abandoned kittens. I am not a Christian or prone to idioms, but when the cashier says she is grateful for small mercies, I nod in assent. Kyrie eleison, Christi eleison. The Latin root of mercy means price paid, wages, merchandise. Though now we use it as compassion, shown to a person in a position of powerlessness, and sometimes forgiveness towards a person with no right to claim it. God is merciful and gracious, but not just. In the Walmart parking lot in Stockton, a man considered armed and dangerous attacked his wife, beating her unconscious. A couple tried to sell their six month old for 25 bucks to buy meth in the Salinas Walmart parking lot. We who are in danger, remember, Mercy has a human heart. Mercy with her tender mitigations, slow to anger and great in loving kindness with her blue employees smock emblazoned with how may I help you. Someone in this place have mercy on us. Thank you. Wow, Erica, thank you so much. Um, interesting sort of through line there. <laughs> um, I, uh, that, no saber tooth well, tigers, unfortunately. No, unfortunately not, but that's okay. I think, you know, I think um, while, you know, previously, I guess I had, you know, the other readers tonight were, you know, might, might have been, uh, well, no, I'm not going to draw a, a comparison. It's more a question of whether you are emotionally reacting within or without, right? And your work, at least these examples, because I don't want to speak for your work wholesale, is, is more reacting outward. <laughs> you know, to what's going on. And just to start, um, you know, working backwards with Walmart, um, it has become such an emblem of the things that Americans are and also don't want to be. Like Walmart is emblematic of that. And it's sort of, I've had this theory for a long time in America that there's, there's no such thing as middle-class people. That's something low-class people call themselves to feel better and upper-class people call themselves to feel better. And, and I think in a weird way, you know, saying, but at the same time, there's, there's an, a necessity to a store that has everything you need, especially during a pandemic. Uh, Trina and I were staying up in Connecticut in the early months of this, and I definitely went to Walmart and I was, my mind was blown, you know, coming from the New York City narrow aisled bodega grocery store to, like you said, the cart that's like as wide as a human being is long. Um, it's, it's really sort of astounding. And then just the idea of Walmart, because it is emblematic of, you know, people of Walmart. That was one of the first sort of internet things I remember. That was definitely the first internet thing I remember being so popular that my mother mentioned it to me once. And I was, you know, it, it's, it's a thing. Um, so it's really interesting. And then the, the two, uh, previous poems, I thought it was really the, the quote about to be human is to, f to see the world ending. You know, I think um, we, all, we all have felt that for generations. I think there's always been an apocalyptic air of things. There's always been some religious movement that's claiming it's the end of the world and all this stuff. But this seems to be the first time in human history where the people who are vaguely in charge are actively taking steps towards that goal whether they know it or not. Um, and I just thought the feeling, um, the feeling I got when listening to your work was, it, 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 it uh, grabbed something. I don't, I don't really know what to say. I can't put my finger on it, but the, um, the, the, this idea of um, juxtaposing, you know, what's going on in the world versus what the, you know, what the people who know what they're talking about are telling us. Bill Nye's on TV literally pleading with people. Meanwhile, there's coal miners who haven't been paid. And like the way you just sort of juxtapose that and the way you juxtapose the coal miners' life struggles with abortion legislation was just, it's almost like you look at America and you're like, I don't know where to start. There's too many problems. Like there's too many and there's, there's people 
who are waving little flags and love crosses and Jesus and all this stuff. And yet they want people to die so that they can have another boat or whatever. And I think any work, and this is maybe, that's my thought. I'm not putting any of this on you, but my, any work that gets me sort of like um, thinking about this stuff and fired up in a way that makes me want to do something instead of just sit there and, you know, I have so many friends who I won't even talk to about politics because of the learned helplessness. You know, you'll mention something and they'll just say like, yeah, what are you going uh, to, they won't let you do anything. Uh, like not good enough. You know, I, I would love to have voices like yours or other people that we've had read on the show or, or, you know, my own in its baby infancy, just people who can actually point out this is what's going on. What are we going to do? And, you know, your example of, uh, in the poem of a, a friend talking to you about learning how to do abortions, you know, we had another um, reader a few weeks ago, Sarah Einstein, who I can't remember where she's a professor, but she tells her classes, I'm the professor whose office has plan B in it. Like, if you need it, like Chattanooga. Thank you, Joanna. Yeah. And, and, you know, having these people who are these voices that are willing to say the things that usually because of decorum or uh, getting a dirty look, whatever it might be, you know, aren't saying these things. I think it's just, it's extremely admirable. And um, it, uh, it also is extremely emotionally affecting on like a, a political level, but a personal level as well. So that was my rant. I want to thank you very much for coming. That was wonderful. And uh, you have several books available. Uh, one coming out as well. I think links went up in the chat, but it looks like the, the all-purpose link is just your name, ericameitner.com. Okay. Yeah, and awesome. thank you. Sure, yeah, thank you. I mean, thanks to everybody tonight. Uh, I yeah, guess this is my most recent one, which I totally didn't read from, but it's about <laughs> all the things. <laughs> yes, I, I actually looked, I looked up your name earlier and I saw an interview about one of the poems in there that was about school shootings. You know, that's that's a topic that, we can get into another time probably, but it's, it's definitely the, the fact is like, these are important things to be talking about because we, we can't put our heads in the sand anymore. You know, we, we can't have to I'm not, I don't know how I feel about Bill Nye. I don't really know much about what he actually does other than television. I think he's, he's a great Mr. Rogers of science. He's yeah. He's, he's a great educator and like awareness raiser and stuff, but like, I don't want to feel like that poor guy has to get on TV and like change his image entirely by cussing at us while blowtorching a globe. Like I would rather we have all thought about it and slowed down well before that. <laughs> Uh, but anyways, all right, excellent. So, uh, holy moly, carry me most recent, uh, forthcoming stuff as well. Thank you so much. Once again, um, really, really appreciate you being here. So, all right, I'm going to wrap things up folks. That'll do it for us. Uh, we're about a uh, two minutes over an hour, which is fine. We're not on, we don't got no bedtimes. We're grown ups. unless you have children, they have bedtimes. So you might have to do something, um, like feed them or I don't know. Uh, anyways, Whew. I always love when I leave this energized and every week, truth be told, I kind of at about, um, at about seven o'clock, I'm usually lying on that couch back there just going like, oh, cause it's, <laughs> cause it's seven o'clock on a Friday and I'm just don't feel ready. And then as soon as we start and the first person starts reading, I am changed and inspired and, you know, having people come here, share their work, um, is absolutely inspiring. And I think to everyone here and just so cool to put faces to names, faces to poems and essays. So I just really want to say thank you to everyone for being here. If you need to reach us or would like to reach us, please, uh, the website is tgicast.com. You can uh, check out all of our information there, which includes upcoming events, past events in video form and a podcast series I've been doing where I interview some writers that has been delayed slightly by the aforementioned technology problems. Everything should be fine next week. Um, you can find myself on Twitter at Ridge Cresswell. You can find uh, the show's uh, talent booker. Uh, I call her the executive vice president of talent relations, Noli Reed on Twitter at Noli Reed. And you can find uh, the show's founder and curly haired muse, Trina Thibodeau on Twitter at 
Trina Tibbs, T-R-E-E-N-A-T-H-I-B-S. Uh, with that, we will end the show. We'd like to hang around afterwards. If people have free time, you know, we'll keep the room open. If you guys want to talk, people have things to ask writers. Uh, you know, networking, I guess. Eh, less formal. Less formal than network. If I ever see a business card in here, first of all, I'll be confused because we're on Zoom. Second of all, uh, I don't know. Yeah, and, and if you want to show your pets, you can feel free. So, all right. Thanks, guys. I'm going to hit stop on the recording.